Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, The Role of the Health Sector in Tackling Climate Change Sustainable Development Goal 13. And today's motto is actually, don't ask what other sectors can do for health, ask what health can do for the others. And this is in a way, a kind of reversed way we are looking at health and the impact on other um, areas. Usually we are asking about this social determinants of health, you know, what do, how do they impact health? How is poverty impacting on health? How is education impacting on health? How is the environment impacting on health? But we are going the other way around. We ask what is the impact of health on other SDGs? And this is quintessentially the definition of the co benefits, which is very much at the heart of today's webinars. We're also using here the um, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as a framework to conceptualize and address the co-benefits. We believe it has a lot of advantages. First, somehow you need to cut the cake, you know, what are the different policy areas, what are the different uh, sectors, and this is a quite accepted way to do it. And it gives us the opportunity to conceptualize the how health sector, how the health sector is contributing to the other SDG. This webinar, like all our webinars, is based on a series of publications. We have a dedicated web page um, opened for this. Today we have a couple of inputs from um, a special issue of health policy exactly on the topic, but there will also be some reflection coming from a major volume uh, published by um, Cambridge University Press. This is the first installment in a series of three webinars. It's a mini series. So we start with climate SDG 13, then we move on with poverty SDG 1, and we will have also a webinar on SDG um, 4. And again, it is politically a very important way to look at it, because if we can demonstrate that health and health system, that spending on health, that investment in health, has positive effects on climate, on poverty, on education, then we have very strong arguments to make for investment in health and health services. So I want to talk about healthcare, environmental footprint or greenhouse gas emissions, because we have excellent speakers today that will do the job and will fill you in in very short time on all the facts, but not all the facts, on um, the impact of health systems on, um, on, on, on climate, but rather also what can be done, done about. And one of our speakers is Sinead Orr from the Institute for Research and Information in Health Economics from France. And Sinead is a, is a friend of the house. She's also part of our HSPA network, which is a very important network and resource for us as observatory, bringing together researchers from different countries. We have also here Céline Bonnet from the Toulouse School of Economics in France. And as you can already guess, both of them are economists and they have contributed to our special issue, which is trying to look from an economist perspective at the co-benefits and the SDG. And then Scott Spreer uh, is with us today from University of Michigan. And actually, Scott is the reason why we have this uh, webinar not at lunchtime, but rather at three o'clock, because lunchtime is pretty hard um, for people in, in Michigan, European lunchtime. But it happens to be that Scott is actually not in the US, but in Austria. So Scott, very good to have you in the same time zone. And last but not least, Luigi Siciliani from the University of York, United Kingdom. And Scott and Luigi are very special to this project because they have technically led some of these publications and the thinking behind the co-benefits, the SDGs, and, uh, and so on. So before we start, a couple of things on the housekeeping. Please use the chat, your thoughts, your comments, your questions. Put them into the chat. We will feed them back to the panelists towards the end of the webinar. We will record this um, meeting, this webinar. It will be lightly edited and put on our YouTube website that will take two or three um, days. And please, if you like this webinar, bear in mind, the next webinar is on the 8th and the following on the 15th October at the same time. So that's about it. And I would say 
moment to invite my colleague Erica and to start the participant poll. Erica. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we've got a little bit of an audience poll for you here just to see where we are um, with the audience. So the first question is, are there any climate action strategies focusing on the health sector in your country going on? Uh, and that's a straightforward yes, no, don't know question. Uh, but then also, if there are any, you know, or any of the following environmental policies in place. So are they looking to reduce emissions from healthcare facilities, tackling pharmaceutical industry pollution, um, including environmental impact in health technology assessment, reducing meat consumption, promotive active transport, so things like walking, cycling, um, decarbonizing the supply chain for hospitals, all of the above, or indeed none of the above. We'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this, and I'll get back to you with the results of the poll of the two key speakers. Thank you very much. Erica, thank you so much for putting this poll together. And the poll is not just random because we try to pull out some of the policy options from the publications we are um, discussing here. We will reveal the results after our two keynote speakers. And this is a little deviation from our usual um, uh, setup. We have today two um, keynote speakers. And the first one is Zeynep and Zeynep Or, and she will speak on greening the health system. Zeynep, the floor is all yours. Put your camera on. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, thank you for the introduction and giving me the opportunity to present my results today. I don't know if I need to convince any of you in the audience that the climate change is an existential threat to our health, our social well-being, and to our planet. You can also, uh, the earth temperature is rising, uh, rising at an accelerating speed. You can also see already the uh, frequent heat waves and inundations and the, all the effect on the ecosystem. And all recent reports uh, confirm that the uh, climate impact are occurring more frequently, faster and to the greater scale than predicted. And current mitigation efforts are not sufficient to slow down the climate change. Healthcare sector represent a big chunk of the uh, global uh, gas emissions worldwide. However, its contribution to the climate change has been little studied or overlooked, both in environmental and healthcare policies. With this in mind, the objective of uh, our narrative review, uh, which was published in the health policy as part of the spatial issue on SDGs, was to summarize the evidence on the contribution of healthcare system to climate change with three objectives. First, we would like to understand the ma main areas of concern. What are the sectors um, contribute the most to uh, climate change? Second, illustrate the current approaches or interventions for reducing emissions from healthcare and their impact with the objective also to identify the gaps in research to support mitigation policies. Before going to the, the results, I just want to summarize our vision of the links between healthcare system, climate change, and health outcomes. Healthcare system, essential for improving health outcomes of the population, contribute to the climate change through its activities, both directly and indirectly. Climate change provokes health hazards, which incomes increase for demand for health care. And this is a loop that we need to break, both producing policies on the supply side by um, intervention at the provider level to reducing the uh, emissions per provider by recycling, better energy use, etc., and on demand side, reducing avoidable demand for care, for example, through primary prevention, patient education, etc. But also considering the, the, the big variation across healthcare system, it is also important to develop system level mitigation strategies by thinking how we can shift care into less polluting settings or reducing low value care or doing things differently, which is can be better for the environment. 
When we look at the impact of healthcare on climate, um, worldwide uh, healthcare sector contributes about 5% of the greenhouse gas emissions. But when you look at nation by nation, healthcare sector can be responsible up to 10% of the national greenhouse gas emissions depending of the healthcare system. So the footprint is correlated with the healthcare sector expenditure and varies across system. Clearly, larger the healthcare expenditure, larger the footprint per capita, but the carbon intensity, which means the CO2 emissions per dollar spent on healthcare, varies largely. And when you look at with the intensity report, actually low middle income countries, uh, especially, for example, China, Turkey, etc., are much higher. It means that they're polluting much more than European countries, for example, per dollar uh, spent. The last thing I want to note about the impact of healthcare on climate, when you look at the uh, trends in the demand for care, aging of the population, etc., and the increasing healthcare expenditure worldwide, you see that the contribution of healthcare to climate change will be increasing and increasing exponentially if we don't change things, if we continue doing business as usual. When you look at the sector polluting the most within the healthcare system, without any surprise, the, the part of the sector polluting the most is the hospital care because of the energy intensity that they need. All acute care hospitalizations, uh, especially surgical operations, are uh, very polluting for the environment, but uh, also certain med medical gases or anesthetics are well identified as being particularly high intensely polluting for the environment. This is followed by the pharmaceutical and medical products. This is both including the production and procurement and consumption of the pharmaceutical uh, and medical products. Clearly procurement policy, uh, policies and the process is important, but also certain medication like uh, meter dose inhalers are well identified as very high polluters and to, to contributing to climate change. This is followed by the transportation related emissions, which covers both freight, but also transportation from patients, visitors, and the, the healthcare staff. And in this picture, primary care and public health care services are polluting much less because they are much less energy intensive. The good news is uh, the literature shows increasingly, I think the, the, the literature is accelerating in the last few years, there are many interventions which are proven as effective uh, reducing uh, the emissions from healthcare. Uh, many interventions target individual providers, especially healthcare facilities, hospitals, nursing homes, but also primary care centers. And I'm not going to list you all of the intervention, but clearly changing um, uh, energy sources, like shifting, uh, using greener energy uh, could be an um, alternative. But the thing I want to note is sometimes we see that simple interventions, changing consumption routines in, a, in an institution, in a facility, could be very, very effective, like switching unused machines or changing sterilization routine of the machines or how you employ the surgery rooms, etc. So there's quite growing evidence on that. Uh, and again, for reducing material, medical and food waste, uh, but also uh, things like replacing plot, polluting gases and greening medical practice. There's quite good evidence targeted intervention to replace anest polluting anesthetics uh, with less uh, polluting anesthetics without impacting patient outcomes. Same with meter dose inhalers. There's also quite big literature a growing, I should say, literature on telemedicine, which can be a um, good, less polluting alternative and can improve access to care at the same time. The thing I want to note with about this intervention, uh, 
these are very good. I don't want to undermine any. They are very many different interventions. And but when you look at the impact of each intervention at the provider level, and when you look at the size of the problem we have, how much we need to mitigate pollution, you see that to have a meaningful impact, any of these interventions first must be diffused across providers and the systems, and also need to be combined with all of different interventions. It's just, it is important to have a systemic approach combining different measures to have a higher impact. There are a few examples. NHS England is one of them, actually having a very systematic way of considering the source of pollution in different sector within the healthcare sector and trying to produce policies. When you look at the gaps in evidence, what we miss, and where more research is needed, there are many, many areas. This is not an exhaustive list, but you could see that on the supply side, there is a, a much more need for evidence on the cost and benefit of climate actions to have quantitative evidence on 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 to go to the policymakers and change things to margins for shifting care. Same on the demand side, you need primary prevention, quantify the impact of the benefits of the, the, the primary prevention, changing consumption patterns, uh, willingness to change in, in consumption uh, from the citizen and patients, etc. To finish, I uh, would like to underline that healthcare system contribute to the global warming while it is directly affected by its consequences. So investing in the environmental system in the healthcare system is an ethical obligation, but it can also be an opportunity because mitigation strategies in healthcare sector can contribute both to change, fight against climate change, but also can bring significant benefits both economically, but also organizationally, because often low value care, bad quality care is also bad for the environment. So there is an obligation to act. And I think there's also a need to act very quickly when you read the reports from the all, uh, all environmental institutions. And thank, thank you, you so I'm much sorry, for this. Matthias, for <laughs> excellent comprehensive but still concise overview and you know reading your article and listening to you now a little bit of mixed feeling on one hand side very optimistic because we see more and more evidence coming up on effective interventions and there's a whole arsenal a toolbox of interventions at the same same time a word of caution that um, the problem might be in the implementation and the willingness to adapt this but the mitigation strategies are a fantastic example for the co-benefits that um, health systems can actually produce. So thank you so much. And Saina, we will see you later when we have the panel discussion and we respond to the questions coming through the chat. And this is my the moment now that I have the great pleasure to invite our colleague Celine to give her speech on reducing meat consumption. Believe it or not, I had today chickpeas, potatoes, and tomato sauce. Please, Celine. Thank you for the opportunity to present this work that uh, we, we published uh, with uh, Marine Quanon uh, on the Health um, Policy uh, Journal. So I'm going to present you uh, environmental co-benefits of health policies uh, to reduce uh, meat consumption. A brief uh, outline of the talk. First, I will present you the link between meat consumption and health uh, and the health policy instruments that are used to reduce uh, meat consumption. I will then present the link between meat consumption and the environment. And then uh, I will examine the environmental co-benefits of health policy instruments. And finally, I will highlight policy challenges to achieving environmental co-benefits. So first of all, meat consumption uh, has uh, some health benefits. It supports uh, dietary needs of more than 1 billion people and livelihoods in low-income countries, and it is a source of high biological value protein and a range of micronutrients. But there are more and more evidence in, uh, in the um, literature about the negative human health externalities of excessive meat consumption, 
and particularly the International Agency for Research on Cancers um, establish that uh, red, uh, red meat consumption is probably carcinogenic to humans and processed meat consumption is carcinogenic to humans. Excessive meat consumption is also related to other uh, diseases, our coronary heart diseases, diabetes, and all-cause mortality. Meat consumption also increases the likelihood of zoonotic diseases, and we know now this is quite uh, that could be uh, could have a, a large uh, consequences. And they also increase uh, the, the meat consumption also increases the risk of developing antimicrobial resistance given the large use of antibiotics in the livestock production. So due to the excessive meat consumption and the associated health uh, diseases, the World Health Organization and many national dietary guidelines recommend to limit meat consumption. And in our work, we have identified four policy, four different types of policy instruments. The first one is the uh, administrative instruments that uh, restrict uh, the offer uh, to the consumer. Uh, we can uh, uh, have, as an example, the ban of advertising of uh, meat products in the London uh, transport, or by promoting a non-meat alternative uh, through a public pro procurement, for example. We also have another kind of instruments, which could be uh, fiscal instruments, that change the relative price of meat product with respect to non-meat uh, products. Um, for example, uh, we can find the tax that was implemented uh, 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 recently on, in Colombia uh, on uh, ultra-processed food products that concern uh, processed meat. Um, those both instruments, administrative instruments and fiscal instruments, are quite restrictive for the consumers as uh, they change the supply of, uh, of products. We can also find other kind of instruments as information instruments uh, that um, uh, reduce the, the, the lack of information for consumers about the health consequences of excessive uh, meat consumption. Um, we could, also, we could find the, the informational message of the World Health Organization as a, a public policy, or we could find some nutritional labeling as the Nutri-Score that was implemented in, uh, in France. Uh, we also have behavioral instruments that are uh, interventions that change the social and the physical environments in which the consumer uh, makes uh, um, his uh, choice. Uh, but the, and the two last uh, uh, instruments uh, only uh, change the, the, the public awareness about the health consequences of, um, of, uh, of excessive meat consumption, whereas the two first ones could imply uh, uh, other uh, economic mechanisms as a change in price, or uh, they could also generate some revenues. Uh, to uh, implement uh, other uh, actions. Um, the scientific literature uh, uh, establishes the, uh, the, the link between meat consumption and the environment, and, in, in, and particularly for four different uh, dimensions. We know now the that the livestock sector uh, is responsible for 11% of the global, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We also know that meat consumption is considered as a major driver of global biodiversity loss and degradation uh, in the world. We also have uh, an important um, uh, concern about the water footprints. Uh, due to the fact that the livestock sector represents uh, a large uh, user of uh, water in the world. Just to give you an example, to produce one kilogram of meat, we need uh, 15,000 liters of water. Uh, we also know that now that the livestock sector uh, is responsible for air, soil and, and water uh, pollution. So. Um, implementing uh, health policies to reduce meat consumption could also um, reach other SDGs, 
as you can see on the pictures, and we, uh, we cite six other SDGs uh, related to um, the, the environment. What is important here is that, uh, uh, what is important be, uh, about this link between meat consumption and the environment is that it is very heterogeneous according to the uh, meat type and the ruminant, ruminant meat has the greatest uh, impact. And this is really important in terms of uh, uh, co-environmental um, co-benefits. What the literature uh, found is that changing dietary patterns can improve the environmental impact of food consumption. For example, if we switch to a meat-free diet, we would uh, significantly reduce the greenhouse gas emission, the land use, but also the water use. Um, uh, switching to a non-ruminant meat diet uh, that would uh, favor uh, pork and chicken consumption would also reduce uh, GIG emissions, land use, but at a lesser extent uh, than the uh, meat-free uh, diet scenario. Even a small reduction in red meat or in total meat consumption could also reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So, if we um, uh, health related uh, policies that aim reducing uh, meat consumption could have some environmental uh, co benefits. But the interesting question is how can health related policies can, can, how can health related policies be improved? to achieve a better environmental co-benefits. Fiscal instruments could be uh, very effective, but the design of the tax is very key. Uh, for example, a tax based on the health social cost would imply to have a large tax on processed meat because they have uh, large health uh, consequences, a small tax on red meats uh, because they have smaller uh, health implication, and this um, lead to a, a, a stable uh, red meat consumption and then to very weak environmental uh, co-benefits. For example, an equal treatment uh, between, um, uh, between red meat and processed meat uh, could reach better environmental co-benefits. We can also think about a tax that could be based on the environmental social costs that are higher than the health uh, social cost, and we can expect to have a larger reduction in meat consumption. However, this could be um, this could come at the expense of food security for low-income households and low-income countries. So we have to be careful uh, with this uh, design of the tax. We also show in our work that. Um, Information and behavioral instruments uh, could be effective, but uh, it depends, the effectiveness depends on the nature of information, the targets, the comprehension of the message, and also the frequency of the message. And then we need uh, long term interventions uh, to, um, uh, to expect to have uh, uh, an effectiveness in the long term. Public procurement can play a role in reducing uh, meat consumption, but must be accompanied by education tools to avoid compensatory behavior in other contexts. So, uh, for example, you, can, you have less uh, meat at school, but you can compensate with more meat at home to obtain persistent uh, change in consumption habits and social norms. A mix of policies could be also uh, very uh, efficient uh, promoting a reduction in meat consumption and also in substitution to alternative protein products. And finally, I will finish on one sentence. In one sentence, um, there are also some very important political challenges in the meat sector because uh, this sector is composed of organized and powerful interest groups with a lot of market powers, and it could be very difficult to, to implement uh, uh, public policies in these sectors. Thank you very much for your attention. Matthias. Thank you, Celine. Thank you so much for this great presentation. And I think it became very clear from what you were saying that reducing meat consumption has very positive health effect, you know, ranging from cardiovascular to, to cancer to many, many others. So these are the health benefits. But this is not all. There are also 
the co-benefits for the mitigation for addressing climate biodiversity water footprint pollution so it's uh, quite quite uh, quite effective in in many ways and thank you so much also for discussing the instruments which can actually help us implementing them even though you've alluded to it it might not always be so so easy to regulate and introduce um taxes celine that was great and this is the moment where i have the great pleasure to invite our colleague Luigi Siciliani to uh, take the floor and to comment this a little bit. Luigi, you've been actually running this project, this special issue from the perspective of an economist, and you've also contributed to the Lancet article where we had tried to map out the concept, what we want to do, and then we have this policy brief where we bring together the uh, political governance perspective plus the economies. Please fill us in. What, what did you hear? What are your comments? Yeah, so I just wanted to explain how these uh, two presentations uh, fit into the broader plan. Uh, so we have this special issue that uh, uh, I have edited with uh, John Silus from the observatory. Uh, and as Matthias said at the beginning, the special issue is to try to document uh, uh, and provide evidence of, of co-benefits from health and health system to other sustainable development goals. Uh, so the whole idea about the, maybe the economic idea of uh, uh, the special issue is that if we can quantify these uh, co-benefits, this can strengthen th uh, the case for investing in health. Uh, so, so that's uh, really the, the, the main motivation of the special issue. So how much mapping have we done in the special issue as a whole? Uh, we have nine articles. We have already, we have one on education. So we, we have uh, quite a lot of strong evidence that shows that, uh, uh, you know, if you uh, prevent health shocks, uh, this really uh, improves uh, educational outcomes for children at the prenatal stage, at the infant stage, at the childhood stage. So that is very well uh, uh, documented. We have a separate article on uh, labor market outcomes. Again, there is quite a Lot of solid evidence that there are co-benefits from health uh, to the labor market outcomes. Uh, you know, there are many studies that try to isolate that uh, uh, if you prevent health shocks, this uh, uh, has positive effects on labor market outcomes. So again, these are positive co-benefits. Uh, we have another one on poverty, which will be covered in a different uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so some of the mechanisms from health and healthcare to poverty go through education and labor markets, uh, but there are also some others th that go through out-of-pocket payments, uh, catastrophic payments, uh, uh, and so on. We also have one on growth, how health can impact on, on growth uh, and the economy. That evidence is more difficult to disentangle, but again, there is like a separate article that tries to evidence that. Uh, we have one more on uh, uh, peace and institution, which is uh, as the SDG 13. Uh, so we have like a nice article that tries to show how people in be better health, they have uh, uh, um, uh, social, higher social capital, uh, they participate more in the political process. Uh, and also some studies that show that, uh, uh, you know, a better funded health system can also reduce the risk of uh, uh, conflict. So, so there is quite a lot out there in terms of co-benefits. So in that sense, the two presentations you have heard today uh, by uh, Zeynep and Celine, they are different type of co-benefits that uh, relate more to the environment. Uh, one is co-benefits in terms of reducing uh, uh, meat consumption. So if you have, if you can prevent, uh, if you can reduce uh, meat consumption through health policies, that can introduce some positive co-benefits. Uh, and again, through um, uh, the health system interventions through, uh, from a, a Zenet presentation, uh, you can reduce uh, uh, carbon emissions or have a positive impact of, in, on the environment. Uh, by, uh, by by doing the, those interventions. So the last bit I want to say is is to focus now on one specific policy that uh, uh, we tend to use quite a lot in uh, health policy, which is a health technology appraisal. So there is a lot of pressure and movement by many countries to try to integrate uh, uh, these environmental costs or emissions into health technology appraisal, either through cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis, or cost benefit analysis. Uh, this has several challenges. You have to quantify the carbon uh, cost or the environmental impact, possibly taking a life cycle, uh, cy life cycle uh, perspective. Then you have to attach a value to it, uh, either in forms of a cost, the cost for the environment, uh, or you have to transform it into uh, equivalent, equivalent health benefits. Um, and then possibly once you are into this new perspective, you have to make sure that you systematically apply this approach that includes the environmental cost when you're assessing uh, all the uh, all the treatments. So that sounds quite uh, uh, quite demanding. 
On the other hand, uh, we have faced uh, challenges uh, in health te technology appraisal to include uh, um, additional complex topics like palliative care, productivity, orphan drugs, informal care. So I think this is like, you know, one more uh, methodological challenge that we have to face uh, to introduce uh, uh, the environmental cost uh, in uh, HDA. As Zeneb said, um, you know, there may be some uh, low-hanging fruit there, uh, that maybe there are things that uh, uh, we can reorganize the healthcare delivery, and this is good for the environment and doesn't affect really health outcomes. Uh, but so, but that's if that's the case, then why are we not doing it? So that raises uh, uh, the issue of implementation and how difficult it is to uh, change. Uh, so people tend to resist to change. We all tend to resist to change which in some way brings to uh, the issue of governance. And whenever I mention the word governance, then immediately the name of Scott comes to mind. Luigi, thank you so much. I think it became crystal clear from your intervention that um, what we heard today about the co-benefits of investing in health, regulating for health, taxing for health, is not just an outlier for the environment, but you find it in other sectors as well. And we want to specify this. And it's really great that you guys, economists, you are you're behind us so that we also can quantify this and see, you know, how important this is. Low hanging fruits, but also the best buys, actually. Thank you so much. And this is now my great pleasure to uh, give Scott Greer the floor. Scott, please Thank you, fill Mat us in on the governance and the politics. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Luigi. So when we talk of health for all policies, we're talking about co-benefits, which is a concept that originated in climate change studies looking at the ways that climate mitigation benefits others. So instead of talking about health in all policies, which as we know, often sounds like we're asking other people to solve our problems, we're showing across this whole project, the different ways in which improving health and health policies contribute to other goals. How health status addresses problems such as poverty or educational inequalities, which is the subject of the next two webinars that we're doing, and the focus of much of today, which is the ways in which health policies and systems influence everything from urbanism, where we build buildings, to inequalities, who we hire in our workforce and how we treat them, to climate change. Of all the different topics that we've worked on in this project, though, this is one of the most exciting. And I think part of the reason it's so exciting is in the presentations that we just saw. We have more and more quantifiable, documented research that is coming out on the importance of what needs to happen, but also real concrete actions that can be taken at all sorts of levels. We also have something that's increasingly visible, and I noticed this in the chat already, that this excites healthcare workers. And that's no small thing in this era of pervasive burnout. Getting engagement in any management initiative can be a challenge, but it seems that greening the hospital, removing some of the most toxic behaviors that you find in any given healthcare system, that's something that wakes people up and makes them want to contribute. So we have bottom-up advocacy taking place, as well as a galaxy of top-down policies. Now, I habitually focus on governance and top-down policies and political leadership, and I'm a, as a political scientist, the first thing that you say about climate change is that it's the political problem from hell. On the top line, it is arguably the worst collective action problem humanity has faced, and people, as a rule of thumb, are not good at solving collective action problems. But this is exciting because there's good news. On one hand, there's simply good news that there's so many different levels and ways and organizations where an action can be taken. How can we reform procurement rules in order to enable more organic food all the way up to how can we change the energy portfolio of entire sectors and entire countries? There's something for everybody, regardless of political direction and all sorts of other pressures on health systems. And secondly, because there's so many nice things that you can do for people. By far the most socially efficient way to solve a problem such as carbon emissions is to price them. But as we've learned, a lot of people respond extremely badly to increasing the price of petrol, let alone to banning something. I'm sitting in Austria where the Greens just took a terrible beating. 
in part because of general voter concerns about cost of living. So one of the things you want to keep in mind when looking at policy tools is how do we give something to everybody? How do you advocate for solar panels by making them something that hospitals and healthcare providers and people can install in a way that they benefit from? How do you make it a positive thing instead of banning and only pricing? But I'll go back one more time to why this is so exciting. It's so exciting because there's so many evidence-based ideas from the bottom up and the top down that can be popular and that people will want to advocate in every arena. Thanks. Scott, I could listen to you all day, but now it's time that we are listening to actually to our audience. And I have to ask Erica. Erica, is coming something through the chat box? What, what is it? And please, panelists, please put on your cameras and your microphones because Erica will fire a couple of questions at you and only respond to those where you feel best suited uh, responding. Yeah, thank you very much. So the first lot of feedback from the audience, I'd like to give the results of the poll um, where, uh, well, where at least the majority, 52%, that terrible number, 52% um, of people in the audience have said that yes, there are uh, climate action strategies focusing on the health sector in their countries. Um, and of these, uh, the really big one seems to be promoting active transport, uh, but also reducing emissions from healthcare facilities, which is quite exciting. So thank you very much for sharing your, uh, sharing your thoughts through the poll. And, um, some quite interesting results. Um, but Looks like get... there's still a lot of opportunity, isn't it? <laughs> there's there's loads of opportunity, which is which is a great thing as well. So um, quite a few questions have been coming in through the chat. Um, some of them quite specific. Uh, one sort of to more to Zeynep, which is um, about the shift to digital medicine and telemedicine. Um, and whether or not that is actually going to have, be so good in terms of decarbonisation when the, these digital tools are really, really carbon intensive in, the, in their own right. So something about that would be really interesting. And a couple of points, points for clarification from Celine. When you talk about meat, what do you mean? So are we including chickens in that, I think, is the, is the basic question. Um, but yes, do we, do we include meat? What about dairy? All of this sort of thing. Should we actually be talking about plant-based diets rather than reducing meat consumption? So something on the, uh, on the uh, details of that would be really interesting. Um, maybe one for a broader one on governance uh, to finish up this round is if the answer is potentially these small iterative changes from the bottom up, um, how do we implement that? How do we actually organize something like that? Do we need to organize something like that? But if we're going to scale it up, how do we actually achieve that? So over to you and I'll go back to the chat box and I see, I'll see you in there, audience. Anna, would you like to, like to start? Okay, thank you, uh, Erica. I'll, I'll take the telemedicine question. This is cl clearly a passionate one. Uh, we, we have a lot of discussion on that because clearly, um, I, I, the, the, there's a lot of studies showing that, this is the first thing to say, the um, benefit of telemedicine is higher than the cost of uh, these platform, telemedicine platforms. So that, that is one element. But second thing is like, it's not a plus sale. It's just not something uh, absolutely the solution like telemedicine in what, where. So what, studies say telemedicine is effective when it is not replicated. For example, teleconsultations are effective when it is not duplicated with face-to-face -face, uh, uh, interventions. It often happen in the more urban areas. It's just like an alternative. The second, there are studies saying like if it is more effective, more than a certain distance. And clearly, most of the studies looking telemedicine in areas, where there is a problem access to care, to specialist care especially, and 
most studies showing the alternative. I think in the chat, someone mentioned about the telemedicine, you can prescribe more antibiotics. Sure, it could be a problem, but I think it could be a problem. It depends on the system. I think this is a quality problem that we face, telemedicine or not, and it has to be tackled, whatever happens. It's not like, let's do telemedicine, not do anything else. But clearly, you can integrate the fact that telemedicine could be part of the solution. And then the next thing is to see how to assure that the quality care in telemedicine and in which settings, etc. Thanks, Zainab. I, I take it from you. It really depends a little bit on the technology and the context in which it is used. And in some use cases, there's a clear and big advantage and other the advantages may be smaller. And it right, reminds me very much to the discussion we have on circular economy. You know, some things are straightforward, single use, but others, maybe multiple use can also be acceptable. And I think this is a clear indicator why we need research, you know, why we need science to really identify and quantify. Just very quickly, I think the 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 the, the thing we are, including myself, the economists are uh, or everybody scared of telemedicine being something on plus on top, rather than the alternative. Yeah. Clearly, that's not going to work because we yes. need to think about being doing less or differently rather than doing more. Thanks a lot, Celine. Yes, uh, thank you for the question about the heterogeneity of the, the environmental impact of meat product, but also for the other products. So I uh, talk about a little bit in, during the presentation about that, but I didn't have time to develop. So I would like to just in a few seconds share one graph, which is in the paper. So do you see it? Yep. Yeah. So you see that the beef uh, is the species that have the uh, um, highest uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We see that lamb and mutton are the second Ooh. one. I agree that dairy products are very important uh, for um, climate change. Uh, that And I, I didn't talk about uh, dairy products in, uh, in this presentation, but their impact is at a lesser extent than uh, beef, so that's why uh, I uh, I have focused on the on meat and particularly on, on on beef. We also have fish that have some environmental impact. It, I think this is uh, one to fifth or seventh uh, rows. Um, but in fact, the the, the main effect. Uh, for the climate change is uh, is with the beef uh, consumption and production. That's why I, I talk about that. Thank you so much. But I'm shocked about the impact of coffee, actually. Yeah, <laughs> this is really uh, <laughs> surprising. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> very good. Thank you so much, Celine. That's, that's very enlightening. Luigi, please. I don't think there was a direct question for you, but I guess you want to com uh, comment uh, them a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I had some uh, thoughts about, uh, well, the, the, the concept we are trying to, to promote here is uh, the one of uh, co-benefits. Uh, so, so in that sense, the point I want to make is that this seems to work well in the context of uh, environmental uh, um, environmental issues, uh, and so I, I think to do this, uh, to to promote this idea of co-benefits, we have to take this uh, societal uh, perspective, um, and uh, uh, and that will help both for the health technology to guide how do we refine the methods for health technology appraisal, but also in terms of investing um, in the green solutions in the health systems. That that's mostly what I want to say. Very good, Scott. It is a hard problem how you scale something that involves behavior change. And we have a history of populations responding very badly to, for example, trying to improve their light bulbs. But two things that I would highlight. One is removing barriers. Examples including various European Union rules that, if on procurement that make it difficult to purchase local food, for example. That's been an issue for years. Rules about procuring new facilities that lead to, for example, the construction of new healthcare facilities on the edge of town with lots of parking instead of reuse of existing buildings, for example. So thinking about removing barriers to local action is a very good idea, including because it enables you to harness the energy of people on the ground. 
And the other one is doing nice things for people is often popular. And while it might be bad for the budget, it's less politically contentious. And that's a trade-off governments have to face. Subsidizing things that people would like to buy is very effective. But Scott, what you're saying is these bottom-up initiatives where people who know best about their impact and how to change it, they very often need to be supported from rather top-down frameworks and uh, legislation and maybe some some subventions, you know. There's a lot of countries that have spent decades trying to make healthcare systems laser focused on a few targets and on efficiency. And maybe we need to rethink some of the policy tools that we adopted on the road to doing that. Very good. Erica, can we have one more question before we before Luigi helps us wrapping up? Okay, only one question. I'm gonna One question. You. No, give us two. Give us two. <laughs> okay. And then you choose which one you want to answer. Okay, yep. so uh, big question. If you could do just one thing in the health sector to, um, uh, what would it be? What is your magic bullet? So what if you could do just one thing, what would it be? Um, and then the key question always is how do we address the gap between these great policy ideas and the implementation of them? Okay, so yes. over to you. Very good. Say that that's a hard not to crack, but um, uh, maybe you go first. Yeah, I can just ignore your question and answer. <laughs> <Not that one. laughs> just, I mean, I don't know if you can do one thing in, in the healthcare system. I was just thinking um, uh, also linked to what Scott said, how you frame the, the, the solution. Because environmental solution, climate options always come like a burden as if like extra spending or a constraint. We should travel less. We should use plane less. In the healthcare sector, I think we have an opportunity because um, what you do for the environment is actually good for you and for the healthcare system. Often improving care quality, uh, like um, adverse safety events, is actually very good because any safety events improve the number of days and increase the number of days in hospitals. And there was some question in the chat about this behavioral change, about uh, better care pathways or prevention. Prevention is good for you. Eating. Uh, less or less sugar, less meat, whatever, is also good for your health as well. I think if one policy idea to 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 sell, I mean, it's a Scott's uh, job more than mine, because as an economist, I think we should work more on the evidence showing that this is going to cost less. This is also important as health economists. We need to produce more evidence that better care pathway costs less good for the environment, good for everybody. And in terms of the, the solutions, this behavioral change solution underlying the, the fact that it's good for us all. It's actually having less medication is better than more medication. Eating less meat better than more meat. I mean, that's my opinion. Thank you so much, Seneb. And you're reinforcing the argument that is de-investing in health austerity policy is probably a very bad idea not only for health and health systems but for all the other sectors as well but investing could actually help a lot not only health but also with the co-benefits celine regarding one solution i think this is quite difficult to uh, to to highlight one solution to reduce uh, meat consumption and have health uh, and environmental uh, co-benefits uh, I think we need to tackle the, maybe the problem of the lobbying in this sector uh, because we think that this is a big issue uh, to, to really implement efficient uh, policies. So maybe if I have one message, uh, this would be uh, this one to, uh, uh, to deal with that uh, political uh, challenges and to find some solution to implement policies. Thank you so much, Celine. And Scott, literally one sentence, and then we will ask Luigi to wrap up. This is really exciting. There's so much that everybody can do and so much data coming online about why it matters and what we can do. Thank you, Scott. Luigi, what's the takeaway? What do you make out of all of this? Yeah. So I think there is one point I want to emphasize, which uh, I think Zeneb has already uh, hinted to, which is uh, there are lots of uh, parallel discussions uh, uh, in the health policy around wasteful uh, spending, 
uh, and uh, you know there is unnecessary treatment, uh, and we discussed that many other times. Uh, so the, the point I want to make is that you know the, the budget is really tight at the moment. So if we magically really manage to ta to tackle those waste, which for this seems the right political moment because there is so much pressure to improve the efficiency of the health system, then we will generate this co-benefit also at the environmental level. So in that sense, I think that's my main uh, uh, message. And the last message is that, uh, uh, again, we are trying to promote the, the concept of co-benefits, which seems to apply to the environmental case. Uh, and there will be two more webinars on those uh, uh, other co-benefits in the other domains quite soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luigi, and thank you to all the speakers. I think this was quite exciting and uh, very, very concrete, and I hope that the audience that you have enjoyed it as much as we did. And as Luigi said, please tune in next week, same day, same time, and we will um, discuss again other SDGs and the co-benefits that health can produce. Thank you so much, and bye-bye.